Hello, I'm Ian and I'm in Dome D at the Observatory Science Centre. I'm a volunteer here and this is the home of the 13-inch um, astrographic refractor. Now, this refractor was actually built in 1890, so as well as being the um, smallest telescope, it also has a great history as being one of the first telescopes to really be involved in mapping the night sky. So in 1890, this telescope was part of an 18 observatory project right around the world where they, want, they tried to map the entire sky, every star in it. Can you imagine what a task that would have been? So over 13 years, this telescope alone charted the precise positions of 179,000 stars. And, you know, without the information that telescopes like this in the late 19th century built, we really wouldn't have the star charts that we have today. The foundation of all that work was, was with telescopes like this. So one of the great claims to fame of this particular telescope is that in 1919, it was used to help prove Einstein's general theory of relativity. And the way it did it, as the lens from this telescope was shipped all the way out to Brazil and they took photographs of the sun in the sky at a time when the eclipse was happening. So you could actually see the stars behind the sun. And they measured precisely where those stars were and then later, when the sun was in another part of the sky, they actually measured where the stars were then. And the difference between them um, measured exactly what uh, Einstein said it would measure. So that was the first proof of that theory of relativity which said that um, gravity bends light. So the sharp-eyed among you will have noticed that actually this isn't one telescope, it's two. So there's a 10-inch refractor which just means a, a lens telescope on the top and underneath we have the 13-inch refractor that the dome and the telescope is actually named after. So the 13-inch refractor was the one used for photography. And the bottom uh, telescope is the one that actually was used in that huge sky mapping project. So the way it would work is you'd have a 6-inch glass plate attached to the end, coated in emulsion, and um, the telescope would actually focus on that 6-inch glass plate, and after a while, a few minutes perhaps, you'd capture the image. And then you'd put it downstairs in a dark room, somewhere where you knew it wasn't going to get light falling on it. And then at the end of the evening, the astronomer would take all the glass plates he'd used up to the main dark room in the main building and actually process them. And one day, I hope, um, you will be able to actually look through this telescope. Um, the top telescope, the 10-inch one, is the one we use for, uh, we have used for open evenings. So that is the one that we'd be looking through on, on a typical open evening. Um, and uh, although it's a 10 inch or a 13 inch refractor, we get some fantastic views of Jupiter and Saturn and the great nebula in Orion. So if you look at the telescope, um, both telescopes are the same length. So they both have a, um, a focal length of 11 feet. So um, there's the main two barrels of the telescope here. And at the other end, and it's a wonderful masterpiece of Victorian engineering, you've got a really heavy counterweight. So the whole thing actually moves, uh, it isn't actually all connected up now, but normally it would, I can move it with just a touch of a finger. And it's so well balanced, uh, thanks to the work of Howard Grubb in Dublin in the 1890s, that you can move the thing so easily across the sky. So now we're looking at the back of the telescope. And you'll notice that the whole telescope mount is angled up towards the sky. Kind of, quite a surprising angle. And that's because it's what we call an equatorial mount. And all of the telescopes at the uh, Observatory Science Centre are equatorially mounted telescopes. And it just means that basically it's angled towards the pole star. So it's uh, parallel to the axis of the Earth. And that means that you can actually move the telescope from one side of the sky to another in just one axis. So you don't have to move it up and down, you just move it from side to side. And that's great because it means that if you've got Jupiter, for example, in the eyepiece, all you have to do is let the telescope track and it'll track Jupiter right across the sky without, in theory, you having to do anything at all. 
So you remember I said earlier that um, telescope, this telescope was used to take lots of photograph on gla photographs on glass plates. Well, at the end of the evening, of course, the astronomer's job was to take all those plates up and get them processed in the main building. Now, you may have noticed if you've been here that it's a very strange layout, this particular site. And you've got a, a lily pond right outside the door downstairs in this dome. So the astronomer would come out in the evening and negotiate this lily pond. But of course, when you've been here all night, and there are, we can't have lights except red lights because it destroys your night vision. Then when you come out of the dome and tired, a little bit kind of sleepy, and you kind of don't really know what you're doing, perhaps, after looking through a telescope for hours on end, um, there's a real risk that you're going to trip up and fall in the lily pond. And in fact, quite a few astronomers did that, having finished a shift here in Dome D. And we know that because when, before the Observatory Science Centre opened, they dredged the lily pond outside and they found lots of old glass plates on the bottom. So we know that at least one astronomer, and perhaps many more, uh, had ruined their entire evening's work by not remembering the lily pond. So you get the sense of what it must have been like for an astronomer. So, you know, way into the night, they're setting up the telescope, they're sitting in their chair here and keeping an eye on the top telescope because that tells them where they're photographing and then the, pl the glass plate will be on the bottom one. Um, and it's very easy in a chair like this, and although it's not the most comfortable chair I've ever sat in, it's very easy when it's late at night just to fall asleep. And that did happen. And in this particular dome, it's not a problem. But in Dome E, which I'm sure you'll have, you've heard about as well, they have a moving floor. And on, on at least one occasion, an astronomer nearly got crushed because the floor was moving up and he was asleep in the chair and the telescope was kind of descending on him very quickly. So there was a real risk there that he was going to, um, you know, at least lose a few teeth. But I think he got away with it. So in this dome, I don't have the luxury of a moving floor. So we've got this a piece of technology from Victorian times called a step ladder, which we use. Um, because if you think about it, when the telescope end is near the horizon, you're looking at something quite low in the sky, then this end is going to be quite high. So we need the step ladder to, um, to actually kind of look through the telescope. Um, and that is basically what you'd experience if you're here on an open evening. So I hope you've enjoyed this whistle-stop tour of Dome D and the 13-inch refractor here. Um, we hope very much to see you at the observatory very soon. Uh, remember that there really isn't anywhere else in the UK that you can get three historic telescopes like this that were used by Britain's foremost observatory, the Royal Greenwich Observatory, um, and that are still in working order. So if you've enjoyed this video, please do, make, uh, do go to our website and look for an opportunity to book a visit soon. Thank you.